so uh, let me tell you um, about my grandson, Carter. Um, well, I, here's the best way to do that. He, um, he wrote a letter. Um, he's, in, he's in second grade, and he wrote a letter. Um, I'll just read it to you. Dear Elon Musk, please make a robot dragon for kids to ride and drive. It would be so fun. You could sell it for one, I don't know how many zeros that is, one quadrazillion dollars. It could be a Tesla product and you could add a flamethrower and you could use it for transportation on Mars. Also add teleportation. Love Carter. Now, I, I just, I think this is absolutely wonderful. Um, just the, the uh, belief that there is a possibility that somebody can make a, a robot dragon that you ride on that could also be used for transportation on Mars and could have teleportation added. Uh, do you have those kinds of dreams? Yeah. Well, I, I wanna, we're gonna talk today about children and what they bring to the table for us. Um, let me uh, review where, where we've been so far. We uh, talked, we, we began our discussion about a transformation with this marvelous passage from Jeremiah 29, where God tells the people of Israel, uh, so seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you, uh, for in its welfare, you find your welfare, right? I invest yourself in the city. Um, marry there, build houses, build gar make gardens, uh, have children. Uh, invest yourself. Don't hunker down and hide away from the city, but no, seek its welfare. You have been sent there for a reason. God has circled Houston, Texas for us on the map and said, that's your city. You go love that city, invest in it and make a difference there. Bring transformation to the city. That's, that's the whole heart of this work we're doing. Uh, uh, the second week, we talked about how each person, that the, the way transformation happens is that God puts a gift inside each one of us. At, at the time that we're created, we're gifted. And then somebody or some church, some, some agent of God comes and invests in that person and brings that gift that God has already placed there into life and, and, and brings it to a flame. And so that that person can, can uh, it, that person's life is transformed and God can use that person to bring transformation. Then last week, um, we, we recognized that the role of community, that everybody needs a place to belong and, and that um, our job is to build a community of kinship that includes everyone, a circle which, in which nobody is outside the circle and everybody feels that place to belong where they can grow and thrive. So uh, today then we want to talk about, uh, about, um, about children and uh, why uh, they are so important to this work of transformation. Uh, so join me in prayer. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, O oh Lord, open our hands so that we might serve. Amen. This, uh, I, I want you to hear again the, just this description, this sort of utopian description that, that we find here in Isaiah 11. The leopard shall lie down with the kid and the laugh and the calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together. The lion eats straw like an ox. And it, it closes, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Ah, it sounds kind of utopian, doesn't it? I mean, the skeptics in us, nah, I don't think so. I don't, it sounds really great, but I don't see how that could, how could that possibly happen? Well, the secret is found in that one, one verse that doesn't look like the rest or the one piece of a verse. It's the last part of verse six. And a little child shall lead them. That's how it will happen. 
Let me give you the context for this uh, passage of scripture. Um, this is in, in the year 720 BC. Now remember in uh, a few weeks ago, we were looking at, at the prophet Jeremiah and, and talking about Jeremiah preaching at the time of the Babylonian exile where the children of Israel were carried off into Babylon. And um, that was between 587 and, um, and 533. And this is um, 150 years before that, and it's the time of the Assyrian conquest. So uh, Assyria is uh, to the north, and uh, Assyria comes, uh, came down and destroyed the, the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, Samaria was its capital, and it destroyed that uh, whole northern kingdom. And, and then King Hezekiah of Judah, he, um, he rebelled against Assyria. Assyria had, he, he, his father um, had been in a protective treaty with the king of Assyria. Well, Hezekiah rebelled against Assyria and Assyria then laid siege to Jerusalem. And uh, it was only by the grace of God um, that, uh, that Jerusalem never fell to the Assyrian empire. But in the midst of all of this, there was, uh, Isaiah comes to prophesy that there will be a king that will come, uh, that will come out of the line of Jesse, and uh, this child king shall be their leader. Now, there's been so many speculations about who um, Isaiah might have might have meant. We who are Christians understand that to be a prophecy of Jesus, uh, the child king. We read this at Christmas um, almost every year, that this child king shall come and lead us into this time of great peace and prosperity, um, a city transformed by the love of Jesus. So, it, it, so this is a passage that's about Jesus, of course, but I think it's about more than that. It's about this realization that if we are going to come to this, this kind of, of prosperity and peace, we will be led by the children. Uh, so that's what I want to, to talk about today. Just two questions that I want us to ask ourselves and see if we can uh, address the answers. Um, uh, the, the first one is uh, this. What do the children bring to this city of God? Right? Why are they important in, in this kingdom of which we're a part? What do they offer us? And then the second, the second question is, um, what do we uh, need to give them? What do we bring to those children? So the first is, what do the children bring to this uh, city of God? Well, I think there's two things that jump to my mind. I suspect you have others. The first is, they bring us hope. I can't look at a child without being filled with hope for uh, what God might do in that child's life, but maybe more importantly, what God might do through that child's life. You can't look at a child without there being some sort of positive, uh, something that comes up inside you that, that makes you realize uh, that there is so much possibility embedded in, in that child. Um, uh, Rosemary Strambicki is a, a parenting coach and she wrote a, a book called The Courage to Parent. And uh, just let me read to you what she says. Uh, this is something I think all of us know uh, in, um, intuitively. She gives words to it. Our children are our only hope for the future. It's a time, it is time to look at ourselves and take responsibility for what's going on in the world. One child at a time, one family at a time, one community at a time, building toward a future in which we all feel safe and unafraid of one another. Now, friends, I don't actually believe that, um, that the children are our hope. I believe Jesus is our hope for the future. And I, I, I believe that the church, the body of Christ, is the vessel that Jesus uh, uh, embodies uh, to bring that future to pass. But I believe that children are the tip of the spear in this work, that, that the church's responsibility to, to, um, to receive and experience uh, the, the hope that children bring to us. 
is so key. They give us hope that, that tomorrow, that we're not stuck in today, but that through them, uh, tomorrow will be different. Now, the second thing that they bring to us is that uh, uh, children bring to us faith. There is a passage in Matthew, it's actually in, um, in other gospels as well, but it's a, a, just such a beautiful picture. This is, I'm gonna read the version from, uh, from Matthew 18. It is speaking of Jesus. He called a child whom he put among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus um, says you must become as little children, what does he mean? He's not saying that uh, we've got to become cute. Um, he's not really saying that we've got to become innocent. What, he, what he's saying is that um, a child knows that she or he is dependent. To, to, to recognize our complete dependence upon God. To to understand, he speaks about humility uh, in, uh, in the next verse, to understand that we are completely at, uh, under the protection and the love of God and that we uh, totally depend upon God. You see, that's what faith is, right? Uh, uh, faith is not uh, checking off the boxes on the Apostles' Creed. Faith is this inner understanding that without God, nothing. Without God, there's, there, we, are of, we are nothing. Our, our whole uh, self is dependent upon God. And as we become adults, we get this notion that I can go it alone. I've got this. I'm the guy. I know a child understands. That's what faith is. Well, one of the things that Rob Dulaney, who's the director of our um, uh, student ministry program, has been teaching us really for many years um, and uh, has, has just reminded us yet once again that uh, young people are not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. And that every great uh, movement uh, for change, for progress, has, um, has come led by young people. And um, we've got to open our eyes and look around and celebrate uh, the young people that are, that are in our midst because of the church of uh, today. When uh, I was, uh, went to my first uh, appointment as a senior pastor in the city of South Houston. Um, we had four children at that time, and I remember arriving at the, at the church and uh, looking around and realizing that there were no other children in this church. The nursery was terrible. It had been kind of closed up. There wasn't any reason to have kids there uh, to, to invest in it because there were no kids coming. And I remember that in that church, when our kids would cry during the service or there'd be some disturbance, um, what happened was people didn't look at them with annoyance. They looked at them with joy. They looked at them and thought, what a blessing it is to have children as part of the church. They're not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. All right, so the first question we ask is, what do the, what do the children in, in our midst uh, bring to us? Hope and faith. Here's the other question, then what do we owe them? What is our responsibility to those children? To the children of the church, to the children of the city? Uh, when I was a, a pastor at the church in Sugarland, we had a, a really, um, bad thing happened. It was on Easter Sunday and um, someone stole the offering, the Easter uh, Sunday morning offering, the cash offering. And it was, uh, it was a bad thing. I mean, it, it wasn't so much the loss of cash. I mean, it wasn't that much cash um, that we know of, it, but um, it really undermined the sense of confidence and in, in, in our competence, you know, 
And as we were processing that in our church council meeting, I remember there was a, a wise member of the church who said, um, you know, I'm just glad it was money. And went on to say, you know, we, we have two very important things to protect. Uh, one is children and one is money. And I'm just glad it, that, that this mistake was around the money and not around the children. Boy, I've thought a lot about that that this, this responsibility we have to the children in our midst is, is paramount. The responsibility that we have to the children in our community is paramount. So what do we, what do we owe them? Well, first, uh, I think we owe them uh, the promise that we make at their baptism to surround them with a community of love and forgiveness until they, by the power of God, shall accept for themselves the gift of salvation, right? That, w- that, we, um, that we nurture and care for and uh, help them to know the love of Jesus. Uh, that's what our Sunday school classes uh, are about, to, uh, f- for them to build that foundation that will last them a lifetime. That's the mission statement of our children's ministry. Um, you're gonna, we're going to hear in just a, a, mo- a few moments from uh, Anna Schick, who is the uh, executive director of Small Steps. But one of the things I love about Small Steps, is it's a, 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 a program of early childhood uh, education for um, young children. And, uh, but, but what I love about it is that it's Christ-centered uh, in the video for uh, Small Steps, that uh, f- video for this uh, Transformed campaign, the component where we're talking about Small Steps, there's this one scene in which there's a, a, a teacher um, reading w- with a child, and you can see on the bulletin bo- board behind them, it says, um, you, it has all these little bees, you know, uh, honey bees, and it says, you belong to Jesus. And I, I, I don't know, I know it's corny, but it just, I just thought that's exactly what uh, these children need to know. They need to be surrounded with a community of love and forgiveness that they would know God's love. That's, that, that's the first thing we owe them. Uh, but you know, you, you ever watch those, um, the infomercials and then they say, but wait, there's more. Uh, we, we also owe it to them uh, to, to give them the resources to become everything they could possibly be. Uh, Listen now to uh, Anna Schick as she talks about Small Steps Nurturing Center um, and our uh, involvement with Small Steps in partnership uh, to uh, create this campus of their ministry at our Gethsemane campus. Take a listen. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited to tell you how Small Steps in partnership with St. Luke's, has transformed the lives and hearts of so many young children and their families in inner city neighborhoods of Houston. For more than 25 years, Small Steps has been serving our youngest children, ages two to six, and we focus on the social, emotional, physical, intellectual, and spiritual development of our children and their families. We exist as an expression of God's love, and we show our families and our young children that they are unique creations of God. We have so many examples of how we have helped transform lives and touch hearts across the generations of families. Today, I'd love to share a few of those stories with you. We have a dad who has spoken to our board of directors to share that when he first came to Small Steps, the only way he knew how to discipline his children was to beat them the way he had been disciplined. He has now totally changed the way he parents his five children, and they will in turn be different kinds of parents in the future. We also have a dad who spoke to our board who talked about attending our parent education classes, which is a critical component of Small Steps program. He talked about learning that saving for your children's future was important. And after attending our finance classes, he went and opened small savings accounts for his two young girls. 
And finally, I want to share a story about Jessica, a mom who has had several children go through our program. When she started many years ago, she was a single mom with two young children driving the streets of Houston, knocking on the doors of churches, of organizations to find a program that would take her children that she could find a job to support her family. Once she found Small Steps and knew that her children were safe, were being fed, had transportation, had options for therapy, she was able to get a job to support her family. She actually now works for one of our Small Steps supporters today. Her oldest child, who is just graduating from high school, Genesis, just received a scholarship to attend college from Small Steps. In her essay, Genesis wrote that her dream is to finish college and open a business with her mom. So you can see how the Small Steps program doesn't just impact the child from ages two to six when they attend Small Steps, but it also impacts the entire family and really changes the trajectory and transforms what their future may be. I am so proud to be a, to uh, be in partnership with Anna and um, with the great work that's going on at at Small Steps. You know, it, this isn't a new uh, uh, phenomenon. This isn't a new thing. This um, teaching uh, children reading and writing and arithmetic uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, uh, there was a, a man in the uh, 18th century named Robert Rakes who founded this amazing um, institution called Sunday School. Now see, you and I think about Sunday School as teaching children about Jesus. And certainly Robert Rakes did that. But Sunday School was formed in the 18th century as a, as a way to educate the children of working parents, working class parents. And many of those children themselves ended up working as well. They were working during the week. So on Sundays, they would be taught in Sunday school. They would be taught how to read. They'd be taught how to write. They'd be taught how to, uh, um, uh, uh, how to uh, do their math. And they'd be taught about Jesus. It's so, it's so tied in to, um, to the history of the church. And even today, there are missionaries all around the world who go in the name of Jesus to offer that basic education for children to reach them at that early age so that they can become everything uh, that God intends them to be. Uh, I, I want you to, uh, to see uh, Joshua. Joshua, I met Joshua at, the, uh, at our Gethsemane campus, and uh, he never spoke a word to me. Um, he came to me with just one shoe on, and uh, he uh, just looked up at me with those big, incredible eyes. And that the expectant look um, in his eyes uh, about the sense of, of wonder at all that was going on around him uh, a sense of joy at being there, a sense of, of, um, of desire to enter into relationship. Boy, it was, uh, it was such a neat moment. And all I can do is look at Joshua and all of the children that show up uh, on, on a Sunday morning here at St. Luke's, all of the children that surround us at our Gethsemane campus, and uh, think to myself, ah, oh, thank you. Thank you for, for bringing hope and faith to us. And thinking, oh my goodness, I don't want to let you down. A little child shall lead us. Let's pray together. Gracious God, oh, we thank you for the children that you have put into our community, into our city. We thank you uh, that, that they bring to us this incredible hope that, uh, that one day um, uh, the lion shall, shall lie down with the lamb and that we will be in that time of peace and prosperity, a city transformed by the love of Jesus. They give us they show us that hope, God, and we're so thankful for that. 
And we pray, God, that we would then not let them down, that we would invest in them and care for them, surround them with a community of love and forgiveness, provide them all the resources they need to become everything you intended them to become, that you might use them to change your world. In the name of Christ, amen. I know that you know our closing hymn. Uh, um, I suspect you uh, sang it as a child, and you, um, if you have children or grandchildren, if you're around other children, um, you've sung it with them. Jesus loves me. Let's sing it together.